Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Balancing Act, Addressing the Physical Causes and Human Factors in Slips, Trips, and Falls, sponsored by SafeStart. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you all for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speaker and her organization are her own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorse them. At the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. You can feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't need to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but due to the large number of participants on the webinar today, not all the questions may be answered. However, any unanswered question will be forwarded on to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll, uh, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived for three months, so you can access it after today's live presentation. Within about a day, just return to this URL to view the archived webcast. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to begin. Our speaker today is Rhonda Piggy. Rhonda is a certified safety professional who has worked in the pulp and paper, chemical, and pharmaceutical industries, and on multiple U.S. military bases in Iraq. She was also a recipient of the National Safety Council Rising Stars of Safety Award in 2014. Rhonda? I am here. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Many companies have taken steps to address the major physical causes of slips, trips, and falls in the workplace. As a result, the biggest single cause of slips, trips, and falls is now human factors, which is responsible for 54% of all incidents. This webinar will review what causes slips, trips, and falls in the first place, from physical issues like wet floors to mental factors like distraction. It will also outline what you can do to reduce slip, trip, and fall injuries by addressing both physical causes and human factors, including how to recalibrate employees' perception of risk, how to build better habits, and how human factors training can help you to prevent slip, trip, and fall incidents in the future. You're all probably here because you've gotten a problem with slip, trips, and falls in the workplace. After all, I don't know too many people who learn about STS just for the fun of it. And if you've got a problem, then you're not alone. It's actually one of the most prevalent types of injuries. Slips, trips, and falls is one of the most common and potentially fatal types of incidents at work and off the job. Falls are the third most common cause of off the job deaths among workers. According to a recent article in The Leader, the BPPA's magazine, they're also the cause of 65% of lost work days in the United States. They also account for 26% of all injury-related visits to the emergency department for people ages 25 and above. Because it's such a common issue, you'd think that it would be a big concern for employers and safety organizations. And it is. In a recent survey, almost 98% of safety professionals said that their organization has some type of plan to address slips, strips, and falls. But despite this, it's still a huge problem, and folks like yourself are looking for a solution. After all, that's probably why you registered for the webinar in the first place. And again, you're not alone. In that survey I just mentioned, only 2% of respondents said that they were able to eliminate switch strips and falls in the workplace. That means that 98% are like you, looking for a solution to this major problem. So today, we're going to go over why this is such a problem and take a look at some of the biggest contributors to STS. And we're also going to take a look at some solutions to the problem. I've been to a lot of organizations that are making big efforts to solve the problem, but in just about every case I see, they're missing one or two elements. And as we'll see, it really takes a well-rounded approach 
to truly solve the problem. You can't leave any of the boxes unticked. So I'd like to start with what actually causes STS. I say it like that because I've talked to more than one person who thinks they've got it covered. You ask them what causes STS, and they'll probably say poor housekeeping, wet floors, and they might list a few other things like poor lighting or people not using handrails on stairs. Well, DLR Safety Daily Advisor conducted a survey about six months ago to almost 1,300 safety professionals, asking a bunch of questions about slips, trips, and falls in the workplace. One of the most interesting questions was about the most frequent factor in STS in the workplace. And it also asked what that cause was. It turned out that poor lighting, stairs, and ladders combined for only 5% and the other 95% was split between just three causes. So what are the big three? In third place is housekeeping issues. That came in at 16%. Here we're talking mostly about tidiness and making sure things are not left out for people to trip on. In second place is wet or slippery surfaces. That came in at 25%. And in first place, and this one is a bit of a surprise to a lot of people. It's human factors. That came in at 54%. Human factors is a bit of a catch-all category as it includes anything from people who are distracted and not looking where they are going to walking too fast or otherwise rushing. Still, that's a huge number. The one thing these three biggest causes have in common is there the result of errors or errors in judgment that people make every day, like how tidy to keep their work area, whether to report a wet surface, how fast to walk, and whether to move blindly around corners. People also tend to perceive these causes, and especially human factors, as being a lot less risky than they actually are, which means it's challenging to find effective and permanent solutions. So to effectively deal with slips, trips, and falls, then you have to juggle both physical factors like housekeeping and wet surfaces, and you also need to deal with the personal, human side of things. It's a pretty even split between physical factors and human factors. And if you let either side of the equation slip through the cracks, then you're bound to have problems. I've actually got a story that illustrates how the physical human factors can combine to create a situation in which it's easy to slip and fall. I worked in, I worked about four years in Iraq running the HSE program for a company that provided basic life support for the military, what we here at home would call city services. Toward the end of my first year in Iraq, I had to go on convoy with the military, which was rare because if at all possible, they like to send a civilian mail. But they thought I was best for the job, which was When we arrived at our destination, there was no lodging for me because they were not expecting a civilian female. The first night there, I had to bunk in a room full of civilian guys. The next morning, a soldier came into the room and said, hey, piggy, and I know y'all are giggling, and he said it with a little bit of a smirk also. We found somewhere else for you to bunk. That location was up a set of marble stairs with a group of military ladies. I was really happy about the change in room location. I was also really happy about the fact that the water came in with us on the convoy, and that meant I could take a shower. I put all my items down on my bunk bed, put on my flip-flops, and grabbed only what I needed for the shower. My head was already there. I was already thinking, I hope that we have hot water. Do you guys know where the shower was located? For those of you who are thinking outside, you're absolutely right. I start to walk down the stairs, and after taking two or three steps, I feel my feet start to slip from under me, and I bounce all the way to the bottom of that staircase. If that were you, what would you have done? 
probably pop up just like I did, right? Look around, hurry up and look and see who's looking. Once I realized that no one was paying me any attention, I sat at the bottom of that staircase thinking how lucky I was. I am surrounded by risk every day. If I would have put money on how I would get hurt in Iraq, I would have said hostile action, but it actually ended up being a slip down the stairs that could have killed me. I could have fallen, breaking a bone, or hitting my head, but I was lucky. Outside of an achy rear end and a slight headache, I was okay. I mentioned this story to highlight one of the biggest causes of slip strips and falls, complacency and inaccurate perception of risk. What you see on your screen right now is the complacency curve. Anytime we start to do a task, whether it's walking, running, biking, or skydiving, when we first start to do it, our awareness is through the roof. Gradually over time, our awareness starts to creep down. It creeps down until we hit what's called the first stage of complacency. That is where we're no longer preoccupied with the risk, so our minds can wonder. Our awareness continues to creep down until we hit the second stage of complacency. That is where we're no longer thinking about the risk unless an external stimulus occurs. The average American takes over 5,000 steps a day. Ask any adult whether they think they're unsteady on their feet or bad at walking, then of course they'd say no. I was 100% certain that I could walk down a fire stairs safely until I didn't. But think about what it means to take 5,000 steps a day, every day. At over 5,000 steps a day, that's a lot of practice, and over the years, people become so good at it that walking feels like one of the most natural things to do. The odds of slipping and tripping must be incredibly small, like one in a million. But 5,000 steps a day is 35,000 steps per week, or 1.8 million a year. And that's just for one person. For every 100 workers, that's 182 million steps every year. That's for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But even if you boil it down to a 40-hour work week, then that's still around 90 million steps. Just based on the sheer odds, there is a huge chance that something will happen. And that's before you start thinking about how the complacency that naturally develops from being so familiar with walking affects things, especially when we start carrying things, getting distracted, or start rushing around thinking about something other than what we're doing. So we've got a pretty big problem, which is that way too many workers are slipping, tripping, and falling. And this is happening for two big reasons. There are physical factors like wet floors or trip hazards that are causing them to fall. And people are also at a much greater risk of physical hazards when they're distracted or not paying attention. We know that both physical factors and human factors are a problem because that's what safety professionals have told us. But we don't need any industry surveys to tell us this. In fact, we can look at our own experience to see how the two different factors can combine to create a whole lot of slips, strips, and falls. Physical hazards like wet floors wouldn't be a problem if everyone was aware of their surroundings 100% of the time. If that was the case, then we'd just see them walk right around them. But we all know that that's not the case. And often people get distracted and take their eyes and mind off of the task. And then, even when we actively warn them about a hazard, it might not be enough. Have you ever seen someone walk right by a wet floor sign without seeing it? Or maybe you've even seen someone walk into one. These signs are hard to miss. They're big and bright, and they're definitely conspicuous. 
Just because there's a hazard doesn't mean workers will fall. And just because there's a sign does not mean that they're safe. And it's not just enough to tell them to pay attention because doing that is no different than putting out another sign. There's actually a reason why workers are inattentive, and it's not because they just don't care. It's actually caused by something called inattention blindness. And I can guarantee you that all of us in this webinar today have had this happen to us at some point. When a person expects something to happen, they tend to focus on something else. As a result, they become blind to the possibility about, they become blind to the possibility that there might be some obstacles to expect even to expect that event to actually happen. This usually occurs with really small things. Earlier we talked about how everyone takes so many steps per, per day that of course they expect that they will be able to take the next step and the next step and the next step. After a while, we become blind to the possibility that our foot could land wrong or the floor could be slippery and we could lose our footing. Because there is no trip hazard in front of us 99.9% .9 of the time, we can literally become blind to the one instance when someone has left something in the way. The term, inatten the term inattention blindness was coined in 1998, and since then it's become a major area of study. Arlene Mack, one of the first researchers on the phenomenon, summarized her findings as follows. I came away from our studies convinced that there is no conscious perception without attention. It's a phenomenon that affects everyone and literally makes them blind to common objects in front of them that they're not looking for. It's why you can put out a half a dozen wet floor signs, but if someone's not looking for them, they can fail to see them entirely. I'd like to take a second to get everyone to think about your last slip, trip, and fall incident, where it happened, whether you were hurt, or maybe just had a close call. Now think about all the factors involved in it. Did you trip over something, whether it was an object in the way, or maybe just your own two feet? Did you slip on a wet surface? Now try to recall how close you were paying attention to how you were walking. Were you looking where you were going? Or maybe you were multitasking by talking. Were you suffering from a bit of inattention blindness yourself? Or maybe your eyes just weren't exactly on where you were stepping. Perhaps you were rushing or distracted. The question I'd like to ask is, were the physical factors 100% responsible for the fall? Were the human factors, like being distracted, the entire reason you fell? Or was it a combination I guess a bit of both. Maybe there was a trip hazard that you probably should have seen, but you were in too much of a hurry or were distracted and looking somewhere else. So take a second and decide, was it solely physical factors and there was nothing you could do to avoid it? Or was there no physical factor at all and it was entirely caused by human factors? Or was it both together that led you to slip, trip, or fall? You all should have a poll in front of you. I'm going to read the question out again. Take a couple of sections, a couple of seconds, and get your vote in. What caused your last slip, trip, or fall incident? Was it physical factors? Was it human factors? Or was it a combination of both human and physical factors? I'm going to repeat it one more time. What caused your last slip, trip, or fall incident? Was it physical factors? Was it all human factors? Or was it a combination of human and physical factors? Okay. Whenever we're ready, we can tally the votes and push it to the audience, please. There we go. Right now we should all be able to see what caused 
the majority of our slip trips and fall incidents. As we can see from the results, it was a 72% of us actually, wow, said that it was a combination of human and physical factors. In most cases, there are both physical and human factors in slip strips and falls. If it was just one or the other, it would be a lot easier to solve. But there are endless ways that the two can combine. And most workplace safety programs tend to focus on the physical issues, but not on how the human factors, like distraction or rushing, can affect them. Can we advance the next slide, please? Now I'd like to start talking about solutions, things many of us are already doing in the workplace, and some solutions that are maybe being overlooked by some safety professionals. And I'll try to lend equal weight to both types of factors, because we just saw they're present in most incidents. I'll cover the physical factors first by taking a look at the maintenance, rules, and other steps you should be taking. And when you're talking about the physical compliance, the, the best place to start is with OSHA. They've been around for 45 years now, and over that time they developed a really rigorous set of rules that outline how workplaces should deal with the physical causes of slips, trips, and falls. Here are some of OSHA's major requirements relating to slips, trips, and falls as outlined in 29 CFR 1910. Housekeeping. Floors of every workroom shall be maintained in a clean, and so far as possible, a dry condition. Where wet processes are used, drainage shall be maintained, and false floors, platforms, mats, and other dry standing places should be provided where practical. Every floor, working place, and passageway shall be kept free from protruding nails, splinters, holes, or loose boards. Owls and covering. Owls and passageways should be kept clear and in good repair. No obstruction across or in aisles that could create a hazard. Covers and our guardrails shall be provided to protect personnel from the hazards of open pits, tanks, bats, ditches, etc. OSHA outlines a number of very specific standards for railings. For example, a standard railing consists of a top rail, intermediate rail, and post. Have a vertical height of 42 inches nominal from upper surface of the, of the top rail to the floor. The top rail needs to have a smooth surface. The ends of the rail shall not constitute a projection hazard. Every flight of stairs having four or more risers shall be equipped with a standard stair railing or standard handrail. Railings must meet OSHA specific standards. There are a number of additional rules for railings depending on the type of material that they are made of and other factors. There are other OSHA rules related to slip strips and falls as well. This is merely intended to give you examples of what they look like. The OSHA requirements cover all the major physical causes of slip, strips, and falls. So what sort of solutions are there that are available to prevent or protect against slipping and tripping hazards? The first is obvious, and that's railings. Obviously, you want to have railings installed on the stairs and walkways. If you recall back to the graph at the beginning of this presentation about the most frequent contributors to slip, strips, and falls in the workplace, stairs only showed up 2% of the time. That's likely because the railings have been so effective at doing what they can to prevent slip strips and falls. Of course, because lots of STFs are still happening, we know that railings alone aren't enough. 
And that goes for the rest of the solution. There are also traction aids. These are products like slip resistant mats, high traction shoes, anti slip cleaning products, those sorts of things. And finally, there are rules and procedures on housekeeping about when and how to clean up, who we should set, who should set out wet floor signs, and so on. So as we've seen, a great number of physical factors are involved in slips, trips, and falls. And OSHA does a good job of outlining rules too. A, eliminate slip, trip, and fall hazards by ma mandating housekeeping and requiring dry floors where possible. And B, giving people handrails to hold on to in the event that they slip. And many of the solutions to these types of problems, floor mats, housekeeping procedures, and so on, are being used at the majority of workplaces across the U.S. A lot of improvements to be made are minor at this. I've even seen workplaces that follow OSHA rules to a T, and they still have STF incidents. So clearly, these types of measures aren't even enough. I do think that these regulations do a pretty good job at eliminating some STF, but there are a few problems. The first problem is that a lot of people work in a constantly changing environment. The most obvious example is outdoor workers in the winter, when snow and ice can make things quite slippery. But even outdoor workers in the summer face a constantly shifting environment. It's impossible to control every trip hazard, no matter how hard you try. Sherry, Sherry Genero, one of Faith Start's account managers for construction, she wrote an article in OHS Magazine about how workers tend to get hurt doing simple things like walking. And she quotes an EHS manager as saying, When we are working on a hazardous or complex task, we do a risk assessment, job safety analysis, and a toolbox talk about it. However, my guys are getting hurt while walking across the site. They simply step on a rock and roll their ankles. It's simply impossible to make outdoor conditions perfectly safe. So if your employees work even occasionally on outdoor conditions, you should take steps to reduce physical factors as much as you can. But it's also especially important to focus on human factors. To help compensate for, for some of the things you can't control in the exterior, but there are other things that aren't always covered by the measures outlined by OSHA. What happens when someone is in a rush and decides they'll clean up a spill later? Or what happens when someone isn't looking where they are going? I'm sure most of us have seen someone walk right into something or someone while staring at their cell phone. And if you've ever stumbled over your own feet, Maybe when you are tired at the end of a long day, you know that there doesn't have to be a hazard present for you to trip on. And when it comes to outdoor conditions, it's nearly impossible to clean up every stray rock on a construction site or to clear every single snowfall as soon as it hits the ground. And let's not forget that you can't engineer out gravity. One other problem about physical solutions to STS is that they're confined to the workplace. And the sad reality is that most injuries and deaths occur off the job. When it comes to workers dying because of unintentional injuries, for every worker who dies on the job, 15 die off the job. This holds true for Swiss trips and falls, as according to the National Safety Council, Swiss trips and falls are the most common cause of death in public places. And while the ratio is smaller for medically consulted injuries, there are still two off-the-job injuries for every one on-the-job injury. When a worker gets hurt at home, the company isn't usually on the hook for workers' compensation. But they still have to replace them with a new employee or miss that person's production while they're hurt, all of which hurt productivity. According to the Society of Human Resource Management, there is a 36.6 productivity loss of unplanned employee absences, which includes injuries. 
A survey conducted by the same organization found that the majority of respondents observed increased workload, higher stress levels, and disruptions to employees' work. 40% of respondents also said it reduced the quality of work output. On top of all of that, workers filling in for absent employees were observed to be 29.5% less productive. And of course, safety is not just about money and efficiency. We also care about keeping people safe and healthy. And there's a lot in common with how people get hurt at work and at home especially for human factors. So while workers may not be able to take non-slip mats and railings home, there are many human factor solutions that apply everywhere, including at work, at home, and on the road. And as you've seen, there's a lot of physical there's a lot that physical solutions can present, but there are a lot of gaps too. And that's why it's so important to address human factors along with OSHA standards. I've got another personal story about tripping and falling, but this one takes place at home. One of my favorite places to visit is New Orleans, Louisiana. I love the sounds, the food, the art. The first time I visited New Orleans was around the time I was moving into my town home. I had no idea how I would decorate it. Then I loved New Orleans so much that I decided to decorate my home in good old New Orleans fashion, all the way down to the beach, which I purchased. <laughs> As someone who loves to cook and entertain, I learned a long time ago that Thanksgiving was not one of the cooking events that I wanted to host. I decided that it was one to pass up on. Everyone comes, they eat up everything, and then you're left to clean it up. The first time I decided not to host Thanksgiving at my home, my mom was not too happy about it. So to make amends, I told her I would cook the day after Thanksgiving. And of course, it would be something Cajun. And what's more Cajun than a fried turkey and a big old pot of gumbo? Surely everyone on the line has seen a gumbo pot. They are huge, and I am short. With that said, I had to stand on a step stool in order to stir all the way to the bottom of the pot. After stirring real good, I step off the step stool and I start to take a walk toward the sink. I feel myself start to fall and I catch myself on the corner of the counter right where the sink starts. I look down and I see my four-year-old nephew and B all over the floor. Things could have been a lot worse. I could have fallen on my nephew, hurting him real bad. I could have even fallen into the pot, and that would have been real bad, plus we couldn't eat the gumbo. So as you can see, some of the aids that we would normally encourage in the workplace, like testing my footing before committing my weight, would have helped me. But there were also human factors at play too, such as my mind not being on every aspect of my task. And even if they would have helped me, the physical aids weren't there. So all I had to rely on was my own ability to catch myself prior to falling completely, so my reflexes. And it's not just me. People tend to be more at risk at home, where people feel safe and they're not looking out for hazards. And most importantly, people tend to be complacent at home because it's such a familiar setting and there's no safety manager or safety posters reminding you to be on the lookout for danger. What that means is that ideally, any solutions for human factors should be able to be applied off the job as well as on the job, since they play such a common role in STS, both at work and at home. Can we demonstrate Slide 26, please. I'm unable to see it. I am hoping that even though I cannot see slide 26, that the audience can. The simple fact that nobody chooses to slip and fall, and many incidents occur and are made worse by a person's state of mind when we're rushing, frustrated, tired, or complacent, 
we tend to make errors and decisions that increase the chance of injury. No matter how effective the rest of our safety program is, your employees have a higher risk of being injured due to a slip, trip, or fall when they're in one of these four states. When we start brushing or are frustrated or are frustrated or tired, the risk of slipping or tripping increases. But as we saw in the discussion about the number of steps we take every day, our comfort level with walking generally stays the same. So one of the big challenges in reducing slips, trips, and falls is adjusting employees' perception of risk and getting them to recognize just how risky walking can be when they're in one of the four states. Common techniques for adjusting perception include playing videos and sharing stories that show the impact of slips, strips, and falls, provide stats that illustrate the potential severity of slips, strips, and falls. You're welcome to share some of the ones that I've mentioned here. Get them to think about their last slip, trip, and fall incident and whether human factors were a contributor. Ask them to explain in their own words how an injury would limit them not only at work, but at home, with their family, and in sports and hobbies. The goal is to get them to actively participate by sharing stories and thinking for themselves. That will help them not only recognize the risk, but to see the impact it will have on their lives. Next slide. People carry out 40% of their daily activities by habit rather than based on conscious decisions. So it doesn't do much good to get workers to adjust their risk perception if they don't also change their habits. At least some of your workers likely have bad habits, like texting and walking, walking too fast, not looking around corners, and as we've already talked about, not looking out for things like wet floor signs. Habits are patterns of behavior, and you can't make bad habits just disappear. They need to be replaced with good ones. Neurologically speaking, studies have shown that good habits literally take the place of bad ones in the brain. So by changing habits, you can get workers to fall back on good behavior when their decision-making ability is compromised because they're rushing, frustrated, tired, or complacent. Building and strengthening habits is a continual process of examination and reinforcement. Important slip, trip, and fall related habits include walking at appropriate speeds and, avo and avoiding overstriding, testing footing before committing weight, using railings, looking in mirrors at corners if they are available, paying attention to where they're walking and not letting eyes or minds drift. Safety professionals can play a huge role in the success or failure in the attempt to build a new habit. It takes an average of 66 days to form a new habit and during that time providing patience, encouragement, and positivity, and positively getting workers to stay focused on habit building and analyzing moments when they make a mistake will help them form better walking habits and stay safer as a result. Next slide, please. By far, the most important way to address the four states and reduce switch trips and falls is to implement a human factors training process at work. A proven human factors training program will implement essential elements of learning in an effective training format that will provide three major benefits. It will help workers recognize the dangers of rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency. Not only that, it will also teach them to recognize when they're in one of those four states and what to do to reduce their risk in the moment. It will increase general personal awareness and motivation to improve 
which, as many of us know, is one of the most difficult things to do with standard compliance training. And it will improve safety skills and habits by giving you a unified approach to habit building and get employee buy-in from the very beginning of the process. The goal is to deliver, the goal is to deliver long-term behavioral changes to help workers reduce errors in injuries, make better decisions, and maintain focus. That will all add, all add up to a lot fewer STFs, and it will prevent other types of injuries as well. Next slide. So hopefully it's getting pretty clear by now that there is no single solution to slips, trips, and falls. And there is no single person, whether it's the safety manager, our CEO, or any individual employee who can prevent STFs all on their own. You have to deal with both physical and human factors, and you also have to get employees on board so they can do their part as well. So what exactly should a safety professional and their employer be responsible for? And what is up to the employee? The employer obviously has to provide training on everything we talked about today. They should also properly maintain work sites, including handrails, non-slip mats, and keeping everything as clean and in good repair as possible. Provide human factors training, invest in quality housekeeping products, develop a strong safety culture, and provide regular reminders on safe habits. All of these requirements should be outlined in a clear and easy to follow SOP. As for employees, it's up to them. They need to really try to actively participate in training and put what they learn to get used. Recognize when they're rushing, frustrated, tired, or complacent, and adjust their actions accordingly. They need to report housekeeping and maintenance issues, participate in safety culture, and make an honest effort to build better habits. And of course, they need to know and follow rules and regulations that you set for them. Of course, it's not always easy to get employees to buy into the fact that they have to be responsible when it comes to their own safety. And that's why human factors training is so important. Because it helps employees recognize that they have an important role to play in keeping themselves free of injury. Next slide. I'm not here today to talk about Safe Start, but I do want to share some of the lessons I've learned from seeing the process implemented because it will be quite instructive to what we've talked about so far here today. You are to be seeing what we call a Safe Start card. I am going to go over that card with you. Safe Start teaches us that there are four states that we have all been in, such as rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency that cause or contribute to the four critical errors, which are eyes not on task, mind not on task, line of fire, and loss of balance, traction, and grip. Even though many people just focus on the four states and the four critical errors, what I like to call the headache, the true benefit of Safe Start is in us learning how to use, utilize those four critical error reduction techniques. They are what I call the aspirin, and I'm going to mention each of these four very briefly. The first one listed is to self-trigger on the state or the amount of hazardous energy so you don't make a critical error. In layman's terms, what I'm asking you, as well as myself and all of our employees to do, is to recognize how we feel and to acknowledge the energy around us. We all know when we're angry, when we're tired, and when we're sleepy. So now if we could just say when we're in that moment, okay, I know I'm tired, but I'm, instead of driving a little tired, now I'm not going to, to take that risk. The next one 
which is listed here as number four, is to work on habits. I like to describe that as perfect practice makes perfect. The best way to make you understand what I mean by that is to use an example of when we get into our car, regardless of what we're doing, if this is something we already do on a daily basis, our hand is already going to reach up, grab that seatbelt, and we're going to click it home. The same is true when we hit a set of stairs. Most of us have been in the industrial setting for quite some time. So unless we're holding something in our hands, Regardless if we're talking to someone, when we hit that staircase, our hand is going to pop out and we're going to grab that handrail. Now what we need to do is to extend those type of good safety habits to other aspects of our lives. The next one, which is listed as number three, is to look at others for patterns that increase the risk of injury. I call this free learning. We want to learn from other people's mistakes. The very last one is listed as number two, and that is to analyze close calls and small errors to prevent from agonizing over big ones. Here all I'm asking is that we all learn from our own mistakes, and should something go, go wrong, we reflect on it and decide what we need to do next time to keep that same thing from happening again in the future. When we learn to apply these concepts, we shift from reactive safety skills to proactive safety skills. These skills will then start to work to keep us safe 24-7 at work, at home, and on the road. I will keep you all on the line all day long, but I am going to stop there and I'm going to turn it back over so that we can start a quick Q&A session. Great. Thank you, Rhonda. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen, and we ask that you consider completing it to let us know your thoughts. Your input on this survey is important because it improves future webcasts. So I, I do hope you take the time to fill out the survey. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please make sure your pop-up blockers are turned off. All right, let's get to some questions. Uh, Rhonda, you talked quite a bit about some, some human factors training, um, but I know some workers may never think that their slips, trips, or falls are their fault. Um, how can human factors training battle this um, it can't happen to me syndrome? Oh, a second to gather my thoughts. Um, what I have to say about that is that sometimes people think it can't happen, to them because they have forgotten about the times when it has. With human factors training, we start to acknowledge when these things happen to us and what role we played in it happening, as opposed to always thinking that it was solely caused by outside factors. I believe that human factors training encourages kind of a shift in the mindset to – it encourages a shift to – I want and I can be safe regardless of what's going on around me. So we naturally move away from just blaming the other guy because we know that the world is imperfect, so we can't expect the things around us to be perfect either. Great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the cost of off-the-job injuries, but how do you actually get people to reduce slips and falls outside of work? I mean, that's an environment that the employer can't directly control. So what – what can be done about that? Well, I know that it's kind of becoming a little circular, but I think that that's where a good human factors training process comes into place. And I'm going to specify a good solid human factors training process. And that's because when you have a good solid human factors training process, it should include a strong home piece. I know for a fact that the Safe Star program does. When you encourage your employees to take human factors home and share it with their families, you are making teachers out of them, and they bring those improved skills back to work. The same is true if they practice the techniques, like I just mentioned, at work. They may intend to not take them home, but because the concepts are human-first focused, it is impossible to just leave them at work. We do not stop being human just because we left work and went home. Okay, great. Uh, 
How long does uh, human factors training, or how long uh, is human factors training effective for slips and, and, fall, and trips and falls and so forth? Um, do the, does there have to be like refresher training at a certain point in time? Yes, I absolutely would say there's no, no um, solid number that I can give you. I am going to say that it's going to be effective as long as we keep on taking the aspirin, meaning those critical error reduction techniques, if we can keep practicing those on an ongoing basis, um, then you'll continue to see the benefit of not slipping, tripping, or falling. Great. Uh, a huge factor with uh, slips, trips, and falls can be an aging workforce. Um, you know, o older workers may have declining vision or lower body strength or uh, other ailments such as arthritis or, or diabetes. How can uh, an employer address these issues? I would say by um, incorporating a good health and wellness program. Um, if you do that, then your workers will be more aware of the limitations within their own bodies. And then if they're adhering to what they're learning in their human factors training, then they know that they have to do something proactive to prevent, you know, whatever their impairments are from causing them to be hurt even worse. Okay. We, we have another question uh, regarding uh, slip hazards at home. Um, we, we, we may kind of repeat things, but I think this is important. Um, how can you get across how serious these hazards are to people for off the job? I mean, how can um, what what can have the impact to people to realize um, you know that this could affect their family uh, and that it's just important off the job when they're at home as they are at the office? My answer to that is to share, and what I mean by that is. I know when I was working in mainstream, a lot of times my employees would get hurt falling out of a deer stand, um, using the ladder to try to change the light on a chandelier without tying it off. There were lots of different things that people were doing, including literally just walking across, you know, a parking lot and rolling an ankle. When these things happen outside of work, I think that it's just as important to share those stories and to share those learnings with the rest of your employees as it is when we share any other near -miss that we have. So I would say just share, encourage your employees to start coming in, sharing those stories. Again, not necessarily to keep plugging Safe Start, but storytelling is a huge part of the Safe Start process. Okay, great. Now, I wrote an article on slips, trips, and falls several years ago, and one of, the, uh, one of my sources I spoke with, he, he mentioned that, you know, walking – um, has, is something that most of us have been doing for decades. Uh, it, you know, it's something that, that we've done and we don't necessarily think about. Um, how do we, with that in mind, how do we encourage employees to correct their behaviors when it comes to things like walking down uh, a, a hallway or walking down steps? How can we correct their, uh, you know, poor walking behaviors to make sure that they're paid attention, that they're focused on walking? I say give them tangible things to look out for. A lot of times we are narrow-minded, not because we don't care, but we're narrow-minded because we don't know what it is we should be looking for. So I can use myself as an example. I had an office in a very busy hallway um, at my site down in Freeport, Texas, and my mind would already be on getting to the copier or getting where it is I'm going, so I would dart out of my door and more than one occasion, almost run into the site manager. Once I went through Safe Start myself, um, I started to, to think about that. Okay, Rhonda, now I know I'm in a hurry. I know when I walk out this door that someone else could be coming also. So I told myself, now I need to start looking for that person. Um, so in my case, it was a person. In other people's cases, it could be um, a puddle on the ground. It could be a rock in the walkway. So I think we just need to point out the things that people should be looking for. And everyone is different, so what it is they need to look for could differ from what someone else needs to look for. We, we live in a, in a world now where, where people seem to be doing a lot. And, and in some respects, I, I feel employees are rewarded if they're able to multitask. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's something that, that employers want in their workers is the ability to do many things at once and get that work done efficiently and well. Um, can you talk a little bit about mental multitasking 
and uh, talk a little bit more about that effect on slips, trips, and falls and how it relates to that. Yes, I can. Um, I may make some people mad with what I'm about to say, but I personally do not believe that we are able to multitask effectively. I believe that we shift between multiple things effectively, but we are not really capable of dedicating 100% of our focus on two things at the same time. So with that said, multitasking and walking. I consider looking down at your cell phone, checking emails while walking. That to me, I consider as someone trying to multitask while walking, but the reality is your feet are moving without you consciously thinking about the steps that you're taking, and your mind is actually on whatever it is you're looking at in your hand. So I would say put the cell phone down, put the notepad down, focus on getting to the destination safely, because once you get there, you'll have more time to focus on whatever it is you're trying to do on your walk over. Um, I know people think that they're saving time by walking and reading or walking and writing at the same time, but I don't recall which study I saw, and I will look that up, but a study was done where they timed people walking through an intersection, those who walked through it without being on their cell phones, and those that walked through it while on their cell phones, and it took extra seconds to actually cross the street than it did when you had your cell phone as opposed to when you did not. So I would say focus on getting there, use the extra time that you gained by getting there earlier to then read your email. Would that, would that advice work for um, uh, you know, a mental thought process? If I'm walking to a meeting and I'm thinking about um, you know, what I'm going to say at the beginning of the meeting, would it be wiser to, uh, again, just focus and think about my walking to the meeting, and once I get there, think about what I'm going to say? Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, that's easier said than done. So if we don't give people something else, I know this kind of sounds a little contradictory, but if we don't give people something else to do, then your mind will wonder. So that would be a, one of those times that I would say use that learn, look for risk patterns in other people, so learn from other people's mistakes. If we can look and see what other people are doing while still, of course, focusing on your walk over, then now you're keeping your mind focused on being safe and what not to do. Okay, great. Um, we have time for one last question. Um, it, it comes from someone who has a who talks about their parking lot um, and and sidewalks, and they've been having a lot of injuries uh, prior to the worker getting into the building, getting into work um, due to snow and ice and so forth. How do you influence wearing proper footwear and attention um, in that situation where the employee hasn't even entered the building yet? They're just going from their car to the office building or the work site. Well, I know a lot of companies have actually made it a rule that when you're on the company compound, certain types of footwear has to be worn. Um, some people do it in a zoning approach where one part of the plant requires one type of footwear, one part of the plant requires another. This can be extended to your parking lot also. So just make it a general rule of what type of footwear it is you expect your employees to have. So, so for example, um, uh, if, if you're in the parking lot and you're walking through the parking lot, um, you, you have to wear flats. You can't wear high heels. Absolutely. Okay. Um, or, and I, or, or for men, you, you have to wear something, uh, you know, a work boot or something with, with a good grip and not a, uh, you know, a dress shoe with, with no tread. That is correct. And I say that because I know a lot of places, and, of course, if you're in some type of um, – clean environment where you can't take the work shoes outside of the workplace, that's a whole other thing. But for majority of our companies, we allow our employees to come in and change maybe in a locker room or wear regular shoes until they get inside of the main building and then you have to put on your safety shoes or whatever the shoes are for that industry. So if we just say once you get on company property, put on the correct shoes that you're going to wear, working through, walking through the parking lot to the building, and then that way it's just clear cut. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I, I know we have a lot of questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, but um, just recall that all of the unanswered questions we received will be forwarded on to Rhonda. Um, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. 
And that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Rhonda, Safe Start, and all of you who listened in. Thank you, and have a great day.